Um, I think Anita sort of preached my message already, which is awesome. I, I love when God is, is working through us all in all. Um, being fully committed to the Lord. Being fully committed to the Lord. Being fully committed to the Lord. Let's look at a passage of scripture in Second Chronicles, chapter 16. We can start in verse 7. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to King Asa and told him, because you have put your trust in the king of Aram instead of the Lord your God, you missed your chance to destroy the army of the king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and the Libyans and their vast army with all of their chariots and charioteers? At that time, you relied on the Lord and he handed them over to you. The eyes of the Lord searched the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you have been. From now on, you will be at war. Let's read part of that again. Uh, verse 9 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And when I woke up, that was in my spirit. The Lord is searching the earth, the whole earth, to see who's fully committed to him. Because to those people, he's going to show, some, some translations say, show himself strong to them, for them, on their behalf. You know, at one point, this king that they're talking about, King Asa, he was facing significant enemies. And in, in facing these enemies, he cried out to the Lord, the Ethiopians, the Libyans. And his heart was completely focused. His, his mind was completely focused. Everything was about trusting God. And so what did God do? God moved on his behalf, and he was able to defeat the Ethiopians and the Libyans. This is what this passage of scripture is talking about. Well, now he faces some new enemies. But in the meantime, he sort of got, you know, how the old saying goes, too big for his britches. He, he got really successful uh, as a king. And so now the, there are some new enemies that are coming against him. And rather than put his trust in the Lord like he had done, against the Ethiopians and the Libyans, he decided to hire mercenaries to go out and fight on his behalf. And he didn't put his trust in God. He put his trust, one, in his money, and two, in the people that, uh, the mercenaries that he hired to go and fight. And then God came to him through a prophet and says, dude, what are you doing? God did this for you against the Ethiopians and the Libyans. And here you are in a similar situation, and yet you don't put your trust in God. You put your trust in your money, and you put your trust in, your, in, in the fact that you hired these mercenaries. Okay, then, just for that, you will be at war forever. Right? And he says to, to the king, God is looking He's searching to see who's fully committed to him because to those that are fully committed, he wants, he desires to show himself strong on their behalf. And there's something about being fully committed that resonates with God. It resonates. You know, there's a scripture in, in John 4 when Jesus is talking to the, wi the widow at the well, the, the woman at the well. She wasn't a widow. The, the woman at the well. And he says again, God is looking. He's searching for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And so what it says to me is God is always looking. God is always looking to see where our hearts are towards him. He's always looking. There's, there's never a point where he's not purveying and saying, okay, who's out there that, that has a heart for me? Because for those, I want to show myself strong. Being duplicitous, double-minded in our thinking about life and the things of life, not good. It is not good. We'll trust God with this, but we won't trust him with that. God, I'll let you handle this, but I'll take care of this. I got this, God. You, you can get in the back seat. I got this. I'll, I'll take the wheel of my life, and, and I'll do what I need to do with my life. God. When I need you, I'll call you. This is what the king is sort of saying. But being double-minded is it's not a good thing. Let's look at James chapter 1. You can start in verse 2. It's consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That's sort of like a, an oxymoron. Consider it joy when we face trials of many kinds. That, that's an oxymoron. What? Well, well, God says, because what happens is your faith is tested and it produces a perseverance and endurance in you. Verse 4, let perseverance Finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That maturity and that completeness is akin to being fully committed to God. See, when we come into to maturity, when we come into a place where we understand what God is after and what God expects from us and we position ourselves for that, then God can do many things on our behalf. This is what I think Anita was saying. Like when, when we can, when we, when we just give it to God and say, God, I, I, I got other opportunities that I can put my trust in, but I'm putting my trust in you. I'm putting my trust in you. Verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask you must believe, did we sing that this morning? We must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from God. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Verse 7 again, that person should not, to, should not expect to receive anything from God. The person who's double-minded, the person who wants to trust God in some things and not trust God and do their own thing other times, that person is double-minded. That person shouldn't expect God to do anything in their life. Really? Really? Why? Because God wants us to be fully committed to him. You know, one of the things that I've learned is that God expects us to put all our eggs in his basket. And we, we try to play the, the, the odds. I'll put, I'll put a few in the God basket. And we'll see what happens. But I'm going to put a few over here. And I'm going to put a few over here. And then whichever one sort of like starts manifesting in a good way, then I'll put some more in that basket. We, let's play the odds. We play the odds. But God expects us to put all 
of our eggs in his basket. And here's the interesting thing. All the eggs we have came from him in the first place. It's not like I created any eggs on my own. And so God is saying, I I care about the eggs. You got them from me. Put them in my basket. And and this is what he's after. Uh, Jesus says, come unto me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's wanting us to bring our stuff to him, and he can exchange it for rest and peace. But if we, if we choose to take our stuff other places, to the internet, to Facebook, to Twitter, because we'll get the thumbs up, we'll get the likes that we, know, we want, and somehow that satisfies us emotionally, but it doesn't cut through the stuff spiritually. And God is the only one by the Holy Spirit can cut through the stuff That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You know, there's a scripture where Jesus talks about being lukewarm. You're not hot. You're not cold. You're lukewarm. You want to ride the fence. God says, I don't want anything to do with you. If, if you're cold, I can help you get over the fence to being, being hot. But, but trying to play the odds, sitting on the fence, you can hurt yourself. You can get hurt sitting on the fence. He wants us to be committed to him. Let's look at Psalm 1. Verse 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in the mockers. Right, Anita was talking about you have to sort of um, get away from the rest of the world, the noise, the, 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 the stimulant, the... the, the Influence. You, you've got to get away from that so that you're clear headed in hearing and knowing God. To, to think, listen, to, to think that the world around us, the stimuli around us, won't affect our thinking, we're wrong. If, 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 if I give myself three hours, four hours a day to watching the news, What's going to impact my thinking? The news. See, whatever I give myself to is is what's going to influence me. And so we do have to get to a place where we just sort of drown out the rest of the world and give ourselves completely to the Lord so that he can fill me, so that when he speaks, when, 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 when he says it's done, when he, when, he, when he prophesies his promises to us, we can believe it. And we can believe it because we've given ourselves to him. And we don't have to try to believe it through, through the filters of, of the news, the internet, the Facebook, the Twitter. And so we're trying to believe God through all this other stuff. And it doesn't have an impact on us because we got all this junk in our filter. Like a, a vacuum cleaner, you know, a vacuum cleaner, it, it works, but because you got all the stuff in it, it doesn't suck the way it needs to, it doesn't pick up the way it needs to. And I think sometimes we got to give ourselves just totally and fully to God. I'm not saying you shouldn't watch the news, but when you get to the point where you become cynical and, 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 and you start talking about there's no hope, that that president is bad and that person is bad. And when, when, when you start talking like that, then that tells me you lack hope in what God says 
about the gospel. Because the most powerful thing in the universe is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where the change comes from. So we do have to drown out all the other stuff. Verse 2. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. And so this is, this is, the, this is the, 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 the sort of answer to what does it mean to be fully committed well, that means that they are the trees planted along the riverbank. You know, in the Bible, um, uh, especially in the New Testament, but also in the, especially in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, when the Bible talks about rivers and streams and dew and rain and almost all, not completely all, but almost all bodies of water or, 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 or water generally, it refers to Holy Spirit. It's making a reference to Holy Spirit. And it is in uh, the reference to, to those bodies of water that speaks to the refreshing nature of the Holy Spirit. So when this scripture is talking about um, the river that's coming from the temple, and I'll show you more of that in a minute. It's talking about the Holy Spirit, that these trees, these streams um, that are planted along the riverbank, verse 3, they are like the trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. These, these trees, these trees in, in the Bible actually represents men, women, people. And so, so these trees, these people who are planted, who are fully committed, who are solid in God, are watered by the river, the Holy Spirit. That there's a constant watering that's happening. And because the water, the watering, is the Holy Spirit watering, their leaves never fail. And they prosper in everything they do because they are planted. They are fully committed to the Lord. And they're being watered by Holy Spirit. This is, this is what he's saying, is that, that he's looking for those who are fully committed, who give themselves to be planted so that they can be watered by Holy Spirit. The results are bearing fruit every season. Every season. There's, there is no season in our lives where we can't bear fruit. No season. And we experience difficult seasons. But even in those difficult seasons, we can still bear fruit. Because we're being watered. We're fully committed. We've been planted by God. And we're being watered by Holy Spirit. And it is that watering that produces in us fruit. And in um, John 15, Jesus talks about the fruit that will last. Last forever. Their leaves never wither. Isn't that interesting? When, when we're watered by Holy Spirit, our leaves don't wither, and we're always bearing fruit. You know, we can bear fruit in our own strength, but, but guess what? At some point, that's going to fail. That's going to fail. But when we're ingesting, when we're being watered by Holy Spirit, it's not our strength. 
It's the strength of God that's working in and through us. And, and that strength never fails. It, it never fails. Our, our leaves never wither, and we always bear fruit, and we prosper in everything we do. Because it's God who's working in and through us. It's, it's not us trying to do it ourselves. That's just, that's just a, as far as I'm concerned, that's just a waste of time. You know, the, 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 the people who are excited and impressed with what they do, what they can do, all, all that tells me, they, they haven't seen God work. When, when, you, when you're so impressed with, with, with what you are and who you are, that means you haven't seen God work. Because you can't be so impressed with yourself and know what God can do. Because when you know what God can do, you'd be like, oh, that, what I did, that wasn't nothing. <laughs> ah, that was nothing. Let's look at Ezekiel. Verse 1, the man brought me back, uh, the man is an angel, this is Ezekiel talking, he's being led by an angel. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold. Again, water from the temple, Holy Spirit, threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. You know, I'm just, I'm always amazed at the detail of Scripture. I'm always amazed at the detail of Scripture. And, you know, here's Ezekiel giving the detail of of. of of the scripture by Holy Spirit. Verse 3, as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to my waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. It coincides with what I just read in Psalm. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into Areba, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever The river flows. Let me read that again. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Just substitute river for Holy Spirit. Because this Holy Spirit flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the Holy Spirit flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to Anglium. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks 
of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the river from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. It's uh, a little more detailed than what we read in Psalms 1, but it gives you a, 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 a fuller understanding. When this angel was walking him through this river, the first phase of this process, this walk, the Bible says that the water was only ankle deep. And here's, here's what I've, 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 I've seen and I've experienced, and I'm sure you have too, when you go to the beach, been to the beach. When the water is ankle deep, you can still do what you want. You can play, you can kick water in people's face, right? You can run, you can do whatever you want. Because the impediment of the water is, is not that significant. But then it goes from, the Bible says it goes from ankle deep to knee deep. And, and even when it's knee deep, you still can do sort of what you want. You've got more water when, when you start going deeper, and then he gets to the point where it gets to be waist deep when you keep going out. You, you can still walk where you want to walk, but now it's difficult. And at each increment from ankle deep to knee deep, waist deep, you lose control. Did you hear what I said? I said, as you get deeper you lose more control. And then the scripture says, it got so deep because it became a river, a river that could not be crossed. And it was over my head, and it was deep enough to swim in. So now there's no bottom, and I can't cross so either I have to exit or I have to give myself to where the river wants to take me because I no longer have control. And I, I feel like God is saying to us, I want to take you where you have no control. You've got to give yourself fully to my spirit. It's no longer ankle deep. It's no longer knee deep. It's no longer waist deep. Now it's a full on river that you can't swim in and it's flowing and you've got to give yourself to the flow of my Holy Spirit. And that's what it means to be fully committed. And if we're honest, we like control. Can we be honest? We, we like to control things in our sphere. We, we, we like control. And God is saying, when you're fully committed, you give up control. That, that now I am the one who's calling the shots. I'm flowing in the river and you have to flow with me you got to go where I go you got to do what I do because it's too much to swim in and we've got to I mean it's 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 too much to, to walk in we've got to just give ourselves to the flow of it and that's not what we always want to do we don't always want to flow with the Holy Spirit. A lot of times, we want to flow with what we want. I'm not doing that. I'm doing this. And at that point, we stay in the ankle-deep water. 
Does it mean God doesn't love us? Does it mean he doesn't care for us? But what did the scripture say? The scripture says God is looking for those who are, what? Fully committed to him so that he can show himself strong on their behalf. And when I'm ankle deep, I'm not fully committed. I'm a little committed. Because I still got my trust in other things. I'm double-minded. I'm half-hearted. I'm distracted. Too many other things can take my distraction away. Yeah. But I'm looking for those who are just crying out to the Lord because they're fully committed, because they're completely immersed in my river. That's, that's, that's the one that I'm going to show myself strong. Right? We, we sang this song, Walk Me Through the Fire. Well, remember the scripture with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah, the, 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 the only way we can walk through the fire is, is guess what? We got to be thrown in the fire. See, the only, the only way I can have a testimony about being, being walked through the fire is I have to be thrown into the fire. And God is willing and able to meet us when we give ourselves fully to him in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. This is what Anita was saying. In the morning, this was my issue. And by the time, the end of the day, no issue. He's looking for those who will give themselves fully to him so that he can meet them. You you, you know, a, a miracle happens when there is no other way for something to happen. That's a, a, that's a miracle. If, 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 it's, if, if there is some other way for something to happen, you know, God can still use that other way, but it's not, it's not necessarily a miracle. Miracle is when there is no other way. The only, the only, what you heard people say, the only way this is going to happen is a miracle. Right? We've heard that. But guess what? None of us like to be in situations where we need a miracle. I can't, I'm just being honest. I don't want to be in a situation where I need a miracle. Because that means stuff is bad. Right? Stuff is bad. Because if there's no other way and I need a miracle from God, stuff is bad. But guess what? When I'm fully committed, we don't have to fear. Because God is a miracle working God. He's a miracle working God. So it doesn't matter how bad it gets. When I'm fully committed to him, he's looking to see on whom he can show himself strong. Who can I rescue today? Who can I pull out of the fire? Those that are fully committed to me. Those are the ones that I'm looking to pull out of the fire. Those are the ones that I'm, with, I'm looking to bless profoundly. Those are the ones. Ezekiel goes on to say, when he brought me here, the angel brought me back, I saw on both sides of the river trees. These trees were being watered by the river. And you know, there's something about this river 
that when it flows and it empties into the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea comes to life. That all of the salt and all of the junk and all of the stuff in the Dead Sea that keeps it dead, nothing lives in it when the river is emptied into the Dead Sea, it comes to life. Isn't that amazing? That the flow of the Holy Spirit, when it enters, brings life. Those things, those people, those situations, those circumstances that were once dead, now are alive because Holy Spirit was emptied into it. The Bible says this, your, your bellies will flow like rivers of living water. What is he talking about? That from you will flow the Holy Spirit and those dead and empty places in life. When you extend the kingdom of God to those places and you let your river flow, open and flow, then those things, situations, and people that are in your life will come alive. And these trees on both sides... Good, strong, healthy trees that were bearing fruit every month. Every month? That's unheard of. Every month. Leaves that don't weather. Because it's being watered by the river that comes from the sanctuary. It's the Holy Spirit that has access to a heart because we've been planted, that we are fully committed. And I think what the Holy Spirit is saying to us this morning, if you're not fully committed, be fully committed. Be fully committed. Be fully committed to me. Not me, Kevin. Me, God. Be fully committed and watch me do things in your life that you would not have thought possible. Opening our heart to him in every way, not just one or two ways, but in every way is what makes it possible for him to do so much in us, through us, and for us. You know, there's a time for ankle deep water in our, in our walk with God, in our maturing in God. There's a time for ankle deep. And then we, we should progress and we see the progression. It should go from ankle deep to knee deep to waist deep. And it should go to a point where we just completely give up control and consumed by the river. We shouldn't fear that. We, sh we, should, we should expect that. You, you hear me say this all the time. That Jesus said it this way. I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. This is him being fully committed. This is him flowing with the Holy Spirit fully. I'm only doing where the, I'm only going where the river takes me. I'm only saying what the river is speaking to me. I'm not trying to do my own thing. I'm not trying to do my own thing. Jesus, I'm fully committed. I'm all in. I don't have some eggs in other baskets. All my eggs are in the God basket. Let me just say this. Jesus. He dies. He gives himself to death. And how many know dead people can't raise themselves? Did you know that? 
dead people can't raise themselves. So he has to, tr- to fully trust that the Father is going to raise him up. I mean, he prophesied it. On the third day, I'm going to get up. Yeah, but you're not going to be the one to, get, to, to, to make sure you get up. You've got to trust God that he's going to raise you from the dead. The Bible says, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. That's that same power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. And he wants full compliance, full commitment. Not because he's egocentric, but because he wants you to see what he can do with someone who's a full participant in what he wants to do, what he wants to bring about in the earth. It's about being fully committed to him. And, and I'm, I'm confident that if, if the Holy Spirit hasn't been speaking to you, he will be speaking to you because I, with this message, I felt like I raised the antenna for, for the Lord to say, okay, you know you should be doing this. This, this is what full commitment looks like. He, he's going to be speaking that to us because I, I just raised our antenna this morning. Holy Spirit is going to be, yeah, you know you should be doing this if you want to be fully committed. You know, that's the interesting thing about the word. Once we hear it, we're accountable to it. But what we get in return is off the charts. These these trees that are planted by, they bear fruit Every season. In the natural, if you can get some fruit once a year, you're doing good. (laughs) Given all our crazy weather. But in the kingdom of God, you can bear fruit every season. Every season. God is for us. He's for you. He he wants to show himself strong on your behalf. And we've got to fully commit to him. The first commitment is our commitment in our hearts. It's not it's not necessarily doing something. Right? I mean, the, the doing comes after. And I think sometimes we think, well, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, that's, that's part of it. But the first commitment comes, you are my everything, Lord. You are my everything. You are my greatest desire. You are everything. And, and once, once that's in me, once I believe that, then all the other stuff that I need to do becomes easy. Right? I don't have to wrestle because I'm not double-minded anymore. I'm single-minded. I'm single-minded because God is everything to me. And so now my greatest desire is for him to be who he wants to be through me. And that I can be who he wants me to be. And extend his kingdom. But that all starts with me, me giving the big yes to him. And getting planted along the river. And let the water of the river feed me. Refresh me constantly. Constantly. Let's stand.